for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, the church has told people what, what they are against, what the church is against. It's time the church needs to help people understand who God is for. God is not against the atheist. God is for the intellectual. God is for the thinkers. God is for the strategic. God is for the people who have an IQ that's high. God is not against those who have a sexual preference and struggling with their identity. God is love and he can fill the parts of a human being that only he can fill. God is not against those who are educating the generations. God is not against them. God wants to equip them to understand that there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. You could know everything but have a failed marriage. But when you have wisdom, you know how to succeed in life. Oh, God is for anybody who wants to get up again. Oh, God is not against those who have been divorced. No, God is for people who have a blended family and are still alive and need a reason to live. I myself come from what was called a broken, blended family. But I want you to know that God takes a broken family and he heals it and he restores it and he gives you more than you could ever imagine. Your life is not finished when you sin. No, Jesus can forgive you and you have a fresh start. God is not against those who are far from God. No, on the opposite. God is looking for a church who would get off their blessed assurance and decide to make a difference for him. God is for the creatives in the world today. God is for those who are, who are right now lifting the level of expression. God is for the people with the big ideas who want to make a difference today. What big idea do you have? Well, I want to let you know God's big idea is this local church being on fire, reaching people for Jesus. That's God's big idea. God has a big idea for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And you say, yeah, but Steve, I'm going through challenges. Join the club, me too. Things are not going right in my world. I know things don't always go right in the world that we live in. But we have a promise that God will be there with us, working through us, helping us along the way. The problems we have in the world today are not caused by God. The problems we have are allowed by human beings, many of which are making poor choices. Dare I say Brexit, 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 Brexit in church. Oh, my Lord Jesus, somebody pray for our politicians. They need help. And if our future is in the political government, we need even more help. We need even more help than ever before today as we look at the confusion morally in the world today. And we look at that and I see that and we're not against that. We're for people. And I want you to know today that so many people don't understand this. So you're like, right now you're listening to what I'm beginning to talk about and you're thinking, well, you know, maybe Steve just wants a bigger church. Maybe we just need a little bit of bigger church, a few more people in it. Maybe that's the point of the sermon. Oh my goodness me, that's not what I'm talking about. Maybe we need to hit 100 dinner groups for Easter. Yay, fantastic, we hit 100. I hope we do that. Brilliant. That's actually not what I'm talking about today. If we just want a few more people to join the church for our own ego, God save us from our own ego so that we can be bigger than the church down the road. God, forgive me, because early on in my ministry, that's actually what I wanted. I wanted a, a bigger church. So I said, how great is life, church? I didn't understand the love of God. But God in his grace has forgiven me and helped me. Because the reason why we're talking about the things we're talking about is simply this. We don't want anybody else to go to hell. That's the difference. I know it's not popular to talk about hell today, but it is a real place. And right now you might think, well, I don't, I don't really relate to that. I don't really understand that. And, and, you know, Life Church is already a big church. Listen, this might be a newsflash for you, but when you get to heaven, you'll notice who isn't there. When you'll get to heaven, you will cry and weep for the people that you didn't share your faith with. You have opportunity right now, and we won't have that opportunity in heaven because everybody's going to be saved. So, so this is our opportunity now. This is our moment now, and it counts. Your life counts. 
Your relationships count. When you decide to move beyond the unknown and into the known and you realize that the people that you're sharing with, the, the, the words that you choose, the prayers that you pray, they count, they make a difference. And suddenly you're like, we're just not after a bigger church of nameless, faceless, unknown people. You know, no, I want my father to come to Christ. I want my cousin to come to know Jesus. I want somebody far from God, my sister, my brother, my neighbor. I want them to know Jesus because I know them. They're connected to me. And I want them with me, next to me in heaven. Now, some of you are like, no, I actually don't want my neighbor in heaven. <laughs> I, I actually don't want that work colleague in heaven. I, you know, I don't really want that family member in heaven. I'm not so sure about that, so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I'm just actually not going to share my faith. Am I just helping somebody today? We have what we have in my family, my Gambiel family. We got what we call a black sheep in our family. Anybody have a black sheep? Please don't look around if the black sheep is in the house. <laughs> if you brought them to church with you today, don't nudge them right now. This is keep your elbows in. I see some elbows in the back row. Please stop. No, a black sheep in the family, you know, it's, it's like we all got them. We, we've all got those people in our family that we're not so sure that we want to come to Christ. We're, we're, we're not so sure about it. I remember one of those in my family who I love dearly, by the way, and he was my dad's brother, and my dad's brother and my dad worked together, and I was with my dad this week, which reminded me of this story, and they were working together, and they had a disagreement, and the brothers that had the disagreement, they just didn't have a disagreement. They went right into the middle of the restaurant and had a fist fight. That's not good when the boss is like getting punched in the face by his brother. You know what I'm saying, somebody? And I'm saying some of these, some of these wounds, they go deep. Some of these hurts, they go deep. Some of those things that people said about you, they go deep. Some of the experiences that happen to you, they go really deep in life. And if you don't deal with those, they're going to drown you. They're going to pull you under. You might still be saved. You might still know Jesus, but you won't experience the abundant life that he's promised for you because you're so weighed down by the hurts and by the pains of your past. But I want to let you know there's a hope. There's a hope for you. And I look at my father now who got saved at age 73 in this church right there on the second row, put his hand on his heart and his hand in the air, and now God is using him to bring reconciliation to the very brother that punched him. Come on, somebody. God wants to reach the family members. He does. He wants to reach them, and he wants to reach them through us. And I said that because I'm going to give you some scripture to help you understand this and, and progress this and, and process this. Matthew chapter 28 says this. It's going to come up behind me. Verse 18. All authority. Everybody say all. all. In heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Jesus has all authority. But then he says this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. This is called the Great Commission, but I want to re-enter the Great Commission. I want to re-enter the language that we're doing. I want to re-enter it because in this series, we've been talking about re-entering the room of church, re-entering the room. We've entered the room of praise and worship as a church. We've re-entered that. We've re-entered the room of prayer as a church. And that's why we've got this door. But now I want to take us to the next level because I just need a little bit of a change over here, moment here. Now we need to re-enter the world of reaching. Come on, somebody. This is a serious poll. This is awesome. I'm bringing it over here so everybody can see this. I asked them not to put the hooks on it because they didn't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> Here's the question. Who is the fisherman in the house? See, 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 Jesus is saying all authority has been given to me. So we would probably agree, none of us here would have a problem that Jesus is the master at catching people. But Matthew 28, is the, the, the point is not that, that, that Jesus has the pole, that Jesus is the fisherman. This is the point. Could I have my helper come up to the stage, please? Come faster, please. <laughs> my helper is that Jesus takes authority and hands over the pole to somebody else. Go catch somebody. And as Jesus begins to do that, 
I'm going to ask you the question. How many pulls are in the water? All right, enough of that. Don't hurt anybody. How many pulls are out there? We've got one pull right now. If just one of us in this house say, oh, you come to Live Church and you're attending Live Church and, and you're just coming and this is kind of new, as long as the pastor has a pole in the water, the church is good, right? One pole, one person, one person reaching somebody, that's all the church is about, right? Or, or maybe we bring up another person, you go to another person, the outreach director for the church. Come, my other volunteer, help me. My second volunteer, I need two volunteers. My second volunteer, somebody. He's coming even faster than the first volunteer. <laughs> So as long as the pastor and the outreach director have got their poles in the water, everything's good, right? A couple of us, just two or three of us, maybe ten of us, maybe a hundred of us. No, 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 no. Every one of you have a pole. Every one of you have the capacity to reach somebody. And I want you to imagine right now, just put one hand in the air. I've just given you a fishing pole by faith. Amen. Some of you are like, okay, I received that. I'm like, others are like, this is uh, stupid. I get it. <laughs> Put your hand down. But, but, but I wanted to make the point that when Jesus says all authority, he wasn't just equipping a few of us. He wants to equip all of us. And that's so essential we understand this in re-entering the room of church because the church has not understood this for thousands to over 2,000 years. The church has not yet equipped the church like it could equip the church. And we're rolling our sleeves up, and I know we got a long way to go as a church in this, and I know we're doing everything that we can do, but we are already doing so much. Last week, our prison outreach team said they had never seen the spiritual hunger that they saw last week as just about 60 inmates accepted Jesus. Not six, 60. Again, today, another team at New Hall Prison. Why? Because People are using their polls. They're using their life experience. But the church says, well, I don't want ex-cons in the church. I don't want people who have gone through a tough past in the church. Who are you to decide who receives eternal life? What right do you have to decide where you're going to put your poll? That's not our right. All authority has been given. And by that same token, some of you are like, well, I don't want to reach millionaires. Because, you know, they probably cheated or whatever. And I don't want to reach athletes. I don't want to reach musicians. I don't like musicians. Musicians, I don't want to reach any drummers. <laughs> I get it. Those drummers are crazy. It's like, but every single one of us have a poll. Now, I've had some interesting conversations this week in the office because I've been trying to re-educate the team about the language of what it means to reach people. And I actually asked for a life preserver and I got this. Because I've realized that in different languages, things mean different things. Now, this is the flotation device. And what this will do is this will keep one person alive in the water. That's it. I don't want to just keep one person alive in the water. Do you? We, every one of us have a flotation device. Guess what it's called? Salvation. If you've been saved and you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your life may not be perfect, but you're going to heaven. Praise God, somebody. You have your life preserver on. But the challenge that we have to face is we have to have the courage to take off the preservation element. And what I love is what we call here in the UK a life buoy. Do you know what that is? Yeah, like we're already out. I can't even say the word right, buoy. I need somebody to say the word right. Gotta help me out. It's an O-ring. The life flotation, an O-ring, you know, like the one on the Titanic, and you threw it to save somebody. You've seen the movie. Got it. Well, I asked for that, so I thought, and I got this. I said, like, give me an O-ring, and I got this. And, and what I realized is, church, we have to re-educate our lives to understand what equipment we need, what equipment we have to equip ourselves with so that we could be the fisher people that God has called us to be. Come on, can we give our fishermen a round of applause? Thank you, guys. You can take your seats, take your rods with you. So I'm going to make two simple points today to help us understand this. The first point is this. Cruise liner or rescue craft? What is the church designed for? Cruise liner or rescue craft? 
A cruise liner is built for comfort, and it never rescues anybody. The language on a cruise liner is, somebody pass me the sunscreen. I need to up my tan. What activities do we have this week on the cruise liner? Because, you know, I fancy a little dancing going on. I got my moves on. I'm going to do it. Maybe karaoke as well. You know, what, what's the activity? What's on the menu? Because, you know, I'm really fussy about what I eat. What kind of food are they going to serve, you know, in the, the conference? Maybe I can get to the captain's table. Maybe I, maybe I can get, like, one of those ten people if I, you know, kind of bribe my way in somehow. Maybe I can get there. That's the language of a cruise liner. The language of a cruise liner is who's going to wake up first and get and beat the Germans to get that seat <laughs> by the pool. Put the towel out. You know, and you get there and you're about a half an hour late and all the towels are already taken. And you're like, uh, maybe I'll just throw a few off and take mine instead. It's the language of a cruise liner. Who's got the best cabin? Who's got the best view? It's the language of a cruise liner. I want to let you know that the language on a rescue boat is so different. The language on a rescue boat is not past the sunscreen. The language on a rescue boat is, where's the battle manual to, 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 to survive the elements today? And I want to let you know that there's a whole lot more joy on a rescue boat than there ever will be on the cruise liner. Because the joy on a rescue boat is not enjoying the sunshine the joy in the rescue boat is seeing somebody get saved and out of the water and be rescued. I mean, that's the joy on the rescue boat. And you're like, oh, you know, I don't know if that really excites me. I want you to know that when you invite a friend and they accept Jesus, or even better, you pray with somebody, your friend, your father, your brother, your sister, your work colleague, when you actually pray and lead them in a prayer of salvation, I want to let you know you're going to experience the presence of God in a way that you never have before. And you'll be more excited about Jesus having been used by God to reach somebody for Jesus than you ever would be on a cruise liner. You might have the best seat on a cruise liner, but I don't want to sit on a cruise liner. I want to be in the helm of a rescue ship running to a rescue. And it's that mindset I want us to understand as a church. We are not just one rescuer. No, we're not. We have so many different boats in this church. So many different kinds of lives in this church. We've got all these different ways, and there are four things that a rescue craft does. Firstly, a rescue craft is built for all weathers. Secondly, a, a rescue craft has excellent navigation. They always know where they're going. Thirdly, a rescue craft always understands where it's been so it can track the progress of where it doesn't need to search. And finally, fourthly, communication is constant. Those are the four things that rescue crafts need to make that count. And I want to show you right now a video from the real life rescue by the, a real life rescue by the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Does anybody even know there is such a thing in Great Britain today? Yeah. Well, they are. They're, 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 these guys are amazing. The R-N-L-I, they live for the rescue. Just watch the screen. It's about a minute long and it'll make my point. And you'll just see on the right, they just spotted right now, there he is, a 13-year-old boy in the water. Can you see him up to the right on the port side? There he is. And they're going to get him right now. It took one minute to do the launch to get him. They know they just have seconds to rescue him before he drowns. The boy has no strength left in his body. And now you can see the boy is saved. That's a real life rescue. Do you know how many rescues we do in this church? I mean, come on. Do you know, do you know what we do on a Friday night when a young person comes down and they are messed up? Their sexual identities are screwed up, but they experience a youth pastor, a youth worker who loves them with the love of Jesus and explains our loving father to them and their whole life is turned around. Do you understand what we're doing right now in Kids Church over there? Do you understand across the parking lot, the kids who are receiving love and attention, the marriages that are restored, the things that God is doing, the lives that are being rescued. I think we should give God 
a huge hallelujah for all that he's doing in lives today. But here's my second point. When lives are on the line, and they are on the line, speed counts. Speed counts. When lives are on the line, seconds count. Because lives are on the line. Oh, I'll just, I'll just work through my issues for another couple of weeks. I'll finish growth track. Oh, I'll finish this Easter, you know, after Easter. Maybe in May or maybe in September, I'll, I'll invite my neighbor. Speed counts. If that rescue team didn't launch like they did... They wouldn't be bringing back a live body. Oh, this is a hard-hitting sermon. Thank you. I'm trying. Because I don't want anybody to feel like they should be pressured. I just want us to understand the implications of our choices. The choices of not sharing, the choices of not risking, the choices of not stepping out, they have eternal consequences. I want to look at, in the four minutes I have remaining, God help me, Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, this is, this is how these principles we see, this is how we see them land. And here's the context. Paul and Silas had been followed around by probably a young teenager for days as she shouted and distracted. And finally, they led her to Christ. They led her to Jesus because Paul knew when he led her to Jesus, there would be such ramifications. He wanted to finish his teaching, so he led her to Jesus. He ends up in prison, but not just any prison. He was in the inner part of the prison. Read with me in Acts 16, verse 25. At midnight, okay, they'd been in there, beaten, and here we find them at midnight. Paul and Silas pray and worship. They pray and they praise, and they sing songs, and they sing and they worship. The word says hymns there, but they were just, they were just singing from their heart. We've re-entered. We're re-entering the room of prayer and re-entering the room of worship, but that's not the point of this. As they re-enter that room and they begin to praise God, they have to praise God through their pain. Okay, this has just got really hard. Life is hard, and in the middle of the pain, if we let our praise go, we're going to struggle, and that's why God asks us to pray. If we pray, eventually we'll experience the praise. So if you're right now and you're in pain in your life, I want to encourage you to pray. And then I want to encourage you to begin to praise God after you sense the presence of God. And you may not even feel the presence of God, but that's when you know, when you don't feel the presence of God, that's when you need to pray and praise. And the presence will follow, I promise. I promise you. If the praise doesn't help you experience the presence of God, then you know what? You can come up to me and talk to me personally about it. But I know this from experience. When I've gone through the toughest times in my life, when I begin to pray, and when I begin to praise God, something happens. And here's what happened in Paul and Silas' life. They, they began to pray and praise, and listen to this. All the prisoners were listening to them. Think about that for a moment. The very pain they were experiencing was being studied by those around them. I mean, it was midnight, and the inner part of the prison where they're in had no light, at all, it was totally dark, pitch dark. Their legs were in irons fastened to the floor so they couldn't move. And they were praying and praising God. Why? Because they were in pain and they needed the presence of God. And our promise is that Jesus will be with us in any pain we suffer in life. People say, well, God, you know, you're allowing the pain. No, God does not allow pain. God sent Jesus to deliver people from pain. And the devil has been lying that for lying about for so long today. It's like, oh, well, you know, well, I might die or I've had friends that die and it's been really difficult. Yeah, but there's a promise of eternal life in heaven. And if you've accepted Jesus, you're going to know the joy, the surprise, the wonder, the awe, the, the amazing plan that God has for us when we're reunited in heaven with people that we love and accepted Jesus. And I can't wait for that day. But here's Paul and Silas, and suddenly, with the prisoners listening, an earthquake happens, a violent earthquake, not just a two-point on the Richter scale. I mean, we're off the scale here. It was felt in the inner part of the jail, 
and everybody's chains came loose. That wasn't just an earthquake. That was angels. That was the power of God taking people's chains off in an inner part of their lives that no one could see. When you praise God, God can take the chains off the parts that no one else can see. The hidden areas of your life that you didn't even know were there, when you praise God, the chains are going to come off. The insecurities are going to come off. The jealousies are going to come off. The envy is going to come off because you're praising your God who created you. And and then with, with all the doors open and all the chains off, finally the jailer wakes up. And the jailer's freaking out because... In the Roman culture, if the prisoners get out, this wasn't just a reprimand by the government. This was death to the jailer and to his family. But Paul shouted, don't worry. We're all still here. We're all still here. Don't harm yourself. So the jailer calls for lights and he rushes in. And this is the question that he asks. Sirs, what must I do? To be saved. Why? Because he'd seen the pain. He didn't understand the praise. And he didn't understand the prayer. And he didn't understand when the chains fell off. But he realized there must be a God. What must I do to be saved? And they they replied this. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And you will be saved. You and your household. I have claimed that promise for over 30 years of my life. And I have seen every person in my family come to Christ now. Believe in the Lord. And you and your household will be saved. That's God's promise. And you've got to apply it. You've got to take it. You've got to grab a hold of it with all your hands, with all your lives. And that day, the jailer and his family were baptized. There was, an, there was a speed to this that was so fast. They were rescued immediately, water baptized, plugged in. Paul and Silas set free through an amazing set of experiences that you can read about later on, where the entire civic authority was called into account. And the tables were switched because of the testimony of Paul and Silas. What if we re-enter the room of outreach and we see God do behind closed doors what you and I could never see with our natural eyes. The conversations at City Hall, the conversations in the educational powers that be, the conversations right now that are happening in some of the prisons because of the faith of people of Life Church, the conversations in the workplaces, the conversations in the schools and universities. When we serve Jesus, when we serve Jesus, people are going to come to us and say, what must I do to be saved? And I just don't mean serve Jesus a little bit. I mean all in, 100% to the wall, no quit, no holding back. We're not going to surrender. We're all in and we're not going to do it at all. You see, you can't just tip your toes in the water and say, oh, I'm good with this. I'm just going to, you know, oh, that's my household. I'm just going to like share one deal. No, you got to be all in. Where's your fishing pole at? Is your fishing pole in the ocean ready to catch the huge variety of fish? Oh, you just want to fish in that little pond with your little pole, like in your aquarium. Uh Uh-uh. Come on, let's smash the aquariums. Let's, let's, Let's have a mindset that says, you know, wherever people are, we've got to step out. Let's have a mindset that actually reflects God's immense and intentional love for people.